Well, that was Zeitgeist the Dendum, directed, created, written by Peter Joseph, and we're very fortunate to have Peter at this event here tonight, all the way from New York. Please welcome into the stage Mr. Peter Joseph. Thank you. Thank you all for coming to this and watching it again. Can you hear me okay? Okay. So, would you like to begin? I mean, I'm just going to go ahead and go straight into questions. I think the movie is pretty self-explanatory. So, uh, anything you want to throw at me, I think we're going to go around with a microphone. Yeah, I've got a microphone here, so, I mean, who wants to be first? Who's got a question? Uh, all right, well, seeing as he's standing right next to me, this might be tough. Dan. Hello there, my man. Um, oh. Thank you very much for that. I've been watching it all week, actually. Oh, I'm looking forward to you being here. Um, the question I've got is that, as I understand it, at the moment, uh, as a population, we're using up about three times the amount of resources that the Earth can sustain. So uh, I think Ecological Debt Day is somewhere in April, which means that after that, we're using up stuff which the Earth can't replace. So, if we've got a, an estimation that the population would be stable and sustainable on our planet at around about one and a half billion, it seems to me we've got three choices in a resource conscious or a resource orientated uh, new world. And that would be either we need to raise um, uh, efficiencies by three times to accommodate the current population we have without disrupting biodiversity and hopefully making a better job of biodiversity than we've got now. Or we need to reduce the population or regulate it somehow. And the missing bit I didn't see in the film, because I'm loving everything I'm hearing, is how uh, if everybody has every opportunity and everything supplied for everyone, um, how do we keep the world sustainable in terms of population? Uh, do you have a, a method of regulation at well, all? When you say resources, do you mean energy or do you mean food or do you mean, uh, broadly speaking, that... Everything. I mean, basically, we've got... Um, well, based so on the research, the feedback. Based uh, on the research that, um, that I have become familiar with is, first of all, that the energy and food resources that we utilize, specifically energy, we are using a maximum amount of what we currently have accessible to us based on the established traditions that are available, based on the established, what the establishment is perpetuating. But as, you, as I denoted in the film, as far as energy alone, there's a complete abundance for many, many multiples, if you do the math on it, of, of at least probably 10 times our current population. Because yeah. the, the sea alone has so much more energy capacity of things that I didn't even go into from, you know, from uh, the heat divisions of the ocean alone which is rampant throughout. You can use that as energy sources. I can't remember the exact name of it. Energy yeah. is not out of abundance whatsoever. No, 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 no. It wasn't about electricity. I can, I can well imagine that okay. even, you know, even with geothermal, there's a million different resources beyond oil that we, that's not a problem. And it's as more far about as food, food and, food, and biodiversity. As far as arable land area, how much arable land area do we have to grow food is what it comes down to. And re reality is, is that we can create arable land area. You can, you can have hydroponic greenhouses and tons of them in the middle of the desert. All you do is tap straight down to the water table. You can grow food out in the middle of the ocean if you wanted to. Hydroponic, you can, any vegetable type of technology, excuse me, any kind of vegetable food production, produce, is so abundant, it's simply a matter of how many seeds you have. It's just creating the environment. We don't maximize it because of our current environment, because we use arable land area, we manipulate it, we destroy the environment through different types of additives that are created. So food production, no, I, I completely disagree. Based on the research that's been thrown my way about what is actually possible technologically, there's no sign that there's any shortage of food whatsoever. And, and looking at the monocultures that are turning up with biofuels and, and such like, is that going to, within these uh, new technologies of food production, 
is, is there a plan within the Venus Project to keep it sustainable in terms of maintaining a rich biodiversity as well, rather than having monocultures just to deal with an escalating population? And do you think the population will just escalate if well, we allow that? Yeah, the, first of all, cities in the sea will eventually happen. And it will, it's not a fantasy whatsoever. 70% of our entire world is, is uh, water. So cities in the sea will be an expansion. In Jacques Fresco, the Venus Project, if you look farther into what he's done, he's actually built and has his full, full productions where he's talked about cities in the sea and utilization of the sea of, from not only from food production, but from people living to energy. It's a beautiful concept in my mind. And eventually, when populations grow too far, you know, it, it, there's so many possibilities that we could easily, and I mean, over long periods of time, we will eventually leave the planet anyway. So, and as far as the biodiversity is, is that what you meant as far as energies, um, as far as, what, what did you mean by biodiversity? Eh? Well, every, I mean, we need biodiversity because otherwise if we don't have, if we have monocultures, then there's a chance that a single virus well, define, can come define your terms, everybody. Define your terms for me. What do you mean by monocultures? Because I'm, these are... Uh, if you look at, say, monocrops, right. um, there's a, a risk with that, uh, you know, apart from all the obvious stuff that people know about, which is, you know, we lose all of our hedgerows and all of the rich wildlife, and, and just the aesthetic interest of biodiversity, but also the, the, the biological ne necessity to cover the full spectrum of, uh, of biodiversity in order to self-sustain it. It's, I, if you take one thing out of the chain, then a lot of the rest of the chain starts to, to collapse. Right. Now, he has absolute biodiversity in that context, by all means, because there's, there is built-in redundancy to all systems when you go into... This is things that I didn't have time to put in detail into the film because it would make the film so long, and the details of his general concept. But if you go into, and you, everyone should go visit the venusproject.com and research and, and read his books and, and go to the Zeitgeist Movement, there's lots of supplemental free information there as well. The, the fact is, is that through technolo it's a technological resource, first of all. It's not even the notions that you describe. It, the technological resource will have built into it the redundancy necessary to make what you say n a non-issue. So I, I think that's all built into what his, his plan is. And ultimately, are we aiming to uh, create everything the Venus Project aspires to in order to sustain the current population or a projected future population of about 9 billion, I think we're looking at, or does it have some vision of how the population will become eventually self-regulating? I think that through time, through, say, the awakening of people in their religious beliefs, People will begin to understand, first of all, no one on this planet virtually has any idea, at least the social systems certainly don't, they don't relate to the environment or the earth on any level. We don't even know how to use the planet. So what's going to happen eventually is the awakening will occur where people will begin to realize their symbiotic connections to the nature and symbiotic connections to each other, and they'll begin to say to themselves, well, if I have a child, what, what is the ramifications of this? They will begin to understand their relationship just like they think of their financial budget if they have a child. And a consciousness will occur where people will not be regulated, no one will be forced, there won't be a one-child policy or anything like that if this ever comes to fruition. I think people will naturally, as they become more accustomed and more aware, think more, less selfishly about having like 10 children because they'll realize the ramifications of that. Most do not. You have religion that tries to perpetuate this, you know, this constant you know, perpetuation of, uh, of humanity, they just perpetually have Catholicism, you know, they don't use protection, you know, they, they just, there's this pumping out of human beings, which is great in its abstraction, but it's not something that is oh, conscious to the state of the planet. So I believe all of those things will resolve themselves based on education, not on like a, not a construct of law at all, but people will begin to realize what the ramifications are. It was very funny, I was having a conversation with Jacques, and he was like, yes, I met someone who had 10 children. I asked her, why? I asked, what are they, what are they for? And it was one of these weird things that no one thinks about, like, what are your children for? Not that they're to be slaves, but it was like a conscious notion of, why do you have all these children? What's the satisfaction? What you tend to find is people have children because it has a, they lack something. They either want tons of love or they want responsibility or they lack something personally where they feel the need to have all of this responsibility or it comes from a religious consciousness where they don't want to have abortions or use protection because their value systems are based on this, you know, this empirical notion that everything is just as it is and I have no control. So I think those things will work themselves out and it's been talked about in great detail by Jacques. So I think, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things I could say on that, but I think it will not be something that has to be regulated. People will grow in consciousness, and they'll begin to understand their relationship, and therefore their childbearing will come into fruition, just like how they treat their environment and how they get, engage in, in the environment in general. Yeah, I'm hoping it works out that way, too. Uh, too. Thank you very much, because that's uh, really helped me engage with you know, the project. Oh, thank you. Oh, I see a lot of hands up.
Um, I think I'm just going to have to start at the front and then start passing it back. So, next question. Hi there. Hi. We're currently embedded in an economic situation where money essentially rules the world. How are the powers that be that control all the money going to feel about this alternative system that can eradicate money? And will it be possible to fight against them since they control all the resources and they control everything that goes with it? Well, as, as denoted by Jacques, the power systems are not going to give up the monetary system. They're just not going to do it. There, there's, no, there's no lobbying to the government for this. What's going to have to happen is, is what's happening now. It's a failure of the entire structure. And this is one of those things about progress that we don't typically un recognize. I mean, life, progress, and social change is not this step-by-step -step evolution because the social structures are... Uh, they are focused on self-preservation. As you pointed at the very beginning of part three, all of our current economic and financial and corporate structures are based on maintaining themselves. So they don't want change. They don't recognize it because they lose profit and they lose control. So I believe that they, what's happening is you're going to have a few steps forward, many steps back, and eventually a big cataclysmic leap forward or a massive ridiculous leap back because it's either we do something drastically like have a global awakening to this type of concept as the system fails as people are put out into the street as people lose their jobs they lose their homes coming from the united states it's getting extremely ugly you have people living in tents tent cities are emerging in the united states which is unheard of for the united states the wealthiest country in the world theoretically so these types of elements these biosocial influences are what's going to make change. It's going to happen fairly dramatically and on the con conversely we're going to move into a third world war and completely destroy ourselves because that's the pattern that happens with these massive economic collapses. So my answer to your question is you have to start to ignore the system, ignore the power elite and start working from a grassroots level and start to just move. And the other thing is why I'm advocate boycott in the military establishment is because if the, if the power elite didn't have the military and the police and the National Guard they would have absolutely nothing because no one would be able to stop the awakening so that's another aspect they don't have anything but their their military structures apart from of course they have their control and their mechanisms but the mechanisms are only valid through enforcement and if people actually wake up to the fractional reserve system they wake up to the fact that the monetary system creates aberrant behavior they wake up to the fact that you know we shouldn't be imprisoning people we should be trying to figure out why they do what they do and eliminating the root causes of that behavior that's when things are going to really get, become a mess for the establishment and they'll be forced to step aside because people won't tolerate it anymore. So what are the odds of martial law in the states and some kind of a, an equivalent? What are the odds of martial law in the states being declared? Very, uh, very high because it's, if and all what it takes be the repercussions? Is, all it takes is one big fear-based fear bank run and all one major bank run on a major bank will trigger a mass bank run on all banks and that's what they're trying to psychologically stop and I know you've had a few bank runs here in London in the, in the UK and we have some small ones in the States but once they do that and the system fails and the un unemployment skyrockets people get all their money out um, they're gonna have no other choice but to get the National Guard into the streets and impose martial law that won't probably won't last very long because if the system continues they're not gonna have enough money to even pay their soldiers I'm serious this is how bad this can get it's a the, the system is a Ponzi scheme it's a pyramid scheme and there's it's it's been a hundred year 100 year, 150 year cycle of this expansion and eventually it's going to have to tilt and they have to have a massive shakeout. And that's what's happening now and they're trying their best to make it as comfortable as possible to not get panic because it's a psychological game. The moment the public finally feels that, that inkling of real panic is what they fear. I mean, they want, they want the system to collapse because it makes more dominance for their financial structure, but they walk a fine line because once it really falls and the people say, fuck this, I'm running to my bank, I'm going to get my guns, and I'm going to sit in my house, you know, this is the type of stuff that's going to start happening, that's when they're going to lose total control and you're going to see police in the streets, by all means. Sorry. Oh, oh, oh.
I think we have experienced it. I think we have. I think we've all experienced those feelings of, of open compassion for each other and understanding that ownership is actually bullshit. Understanding that, that property and materialism is not real. I think when we treat each other like family, which is what we really are, genealogically, literally, I mean, we go back far enough, we're all fucking related. I mean, I think it's very real. I think we do experience it. Well, yeah. I disagree. I disagree. Okay. Um, it's, it's indeed important to be well educated and, and this movie is educating people in a, in a way I believe is very good. But what I feel there is some, some things uh, I've learned in my life and um, greed is ex exists because lack of love. Because people are in lack of love, they are in greed. Sure. And so they want to grasp things, they want to take other things and they, they don't realize what they are doing in effect, completely. I can, I can relate and, to that. And uh, this lack of love is because we are all interweaving with each other and if we start to open our hearts for all of us, also for those people who are in greed, but we choose what you tell, we choose what we want in our life by indeed uh, doing boycotts, not taking part in all these actions, mm -hmm. but we open our hearts, we truly forgive all these people. Right. They cannot be in greed anymore. Greed yes. will just vanish. Right. Because if I love you, you cannot be greedy of me. You I don't agree. have to take anything from me anymore. Right, which is the, the ultimate state of having a system where things are just available. Because if you have things available, I'm just going to jump to this very quickly because there's many different angles here, but if you have, so you can walk into a grocery store and get the food that you need and it, you don't have to pay anything for it. So what does that mean? It means that it, why would someone run in there and start stealing tomatoes? Because they would, they would have no reason for it. They couldn't sell it. They would have, they would, they would go bad eventually. You know, there's no reason, to, even if it was physical properties like, like televisions and things like that. Why would someone want to just take a bunch of televisions? They can't sell it. They can't, they have no reason to hoard it. And what that means is an openness of love for the community. It's a, it's an open trust. So the greed would vanish because greed is essentially a culturally produced element, just like bigotry. No one's born with greed. You're born with a general sense of wanting things and learning. But greed in a materialistic sense, as far as all this shit's concerned, that's conditioned upon us. You know, greed for my clothes, greed for everything that's fought for in a greed sense is conditioned and we have to condition out of that and that's why I advocate this social system because it would actually eliminate that. Well, it's not my system. It's, I'm sorry, what did you say? I'll explain the question if you, to those who can't hear it. Okay. Hey, so basically, all right. So there, you you you're saying there's like all these people that are up high in power trying to, you know, destroy the, the system or the system that was established. Um, well, I, well, actually, what wait, I wait, 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 okay. <laughs> um, basically, the government is is an entity, right? Yes. But this is an entity full of people. It's comprised of people, right? And these people do jobs, right? And so. I mean, maybe there are a few people up high that are like trying to, to, to do bad, but you're forgetting that there's many, many more people in the, like within these entities that aren't bad, that aren't bad, and that, and that oh. they, and they do fight these things. Like they, it's not, it's not all black and white, you know, it's not just like, I agree. yeah, there's these bad people and that's all there is. There's, there's uh, also good people, man, you know, like. Of course. 
Well, that's the thing. That's what I'm saying. First of all, there's no such thing as a bad person as far as I'm concerned. And I, I, maybe you misunderstood or I miscommunicated you know poorly. I meant, you know what I mean, though? Like, it's not I know exactly what you mean. No, I, I think it's, uh, no, the people, first of all, if you took out everybody at the top, you took them out, there would be someone stepping in to take their place very quickly because of what the environment sets up. But there's, there are plenty of other people. It's the environment that dictates this. There are plenty of other people that don't have that type of experience and therefore don't have that type of excessive greed, obsessive need for power and control. But it is an environmental condition. What I mean by this, and very specifically the effect that there's no bad people, but it's just a big, huge, massive threshold of different forms of aberrant behavior based on the social structure, Everyone is corrupt, but everyone is good. It's both and all the same. See, every time I look at you, if say you're a, ser a serial killer, and, I, and I, I was hanging, I was like, oh, this guy's a serial killer. I wouldn't look at you and say, well, I want to kill this guy, or he should be put, put, you know, put in jail. I'd say this guy is a victim of his culture. It's not him that's bad or anybody. It's the culture that culminated you. Therefore, to really go after what aberrant behavior is, crime and corruption and the corporate and the, the Illuminati and the New World Order, you have to go after the root causes of this, and can that's I, what's going to change talk? things. Um, it's like, I, I, just, I just think that, I mean, you, you got, you, that's all good what you just said, it's all, it's all fair and good, there, there are no bad people, but I mean, when I say bad people, I mean bad people with bad intentions, you know, like, well, I know. they're bad. Well, we all have bad all, intentions in this system. But, but it's like, Mel, look, I'll, I'll give you an example and then I'll go and I'll let you guys, <laughs> there was a, there was a, there was a, right, make it quick. there was a big case with Guantanamo Bay, I don't know if you, if you read about this. The, there was a, an internal FBI invest, there was like an, an internal battle between the FBI and the Justice Department. And there was, uh, they, there were like about 4,000 complaints from Guantanamo Bay prisoners that they had been tortured and all that stuff. Sure. And, um, and I mean, the F within the FBI, a group of people started to investigate this. And then they got shut down by the Justice Department. Of course. But, but it was released. And, and like, man, you can find it online. Just go look. It's like a 400-page document detailing all, the, all this investigation sure. that went on. And it was like a big thing because it was a an internal battle within the within this entity of government that, sure. you know, you... you I'm, I'm not just blindly saying that the government is just black and white bad. All I'm saying is that there are obviously many people that are in the system that want to help. For example, John Perkins, who used to be an economic hitman, he changed. He decided to come forward. I'm not... That's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, I agree with you. Okay. Are you Hi there, Peter. Hi. Uh, thank you, first of all, so much for uh, creating this film and everything. Um, it's thank brilliant. You, sure. It gives a good message. But what I find, there's some interesting bits in there which I think I have to really disagree with. And I'm sure you can respect that. Uh, first of all, you um, start your film with Krishnamurti, who is a Hindu philosopher. Uh, but whereas in the film itself, um, halfway through, I saw that um, you were saying that all religions, including Hinduism, uh, uh, Christianity, Islam, all, it's all barriers to, to progression. Whereas all your quotes in there are from Hinduism, like consciousness, one love, yeah, the world is one family. The, the roots which people get are from these ancient Aboriginal religions and Native American cultures and, you know, um, what, what, what your film is trying to portray. At the same time, it's so sensationalism. What I find is um, you've got to gathered all the good bits which people want to hear about. You know, we know there's all shit going on. We know all the crap is going on at the moment. And all, all, what we talk about and the paranoia this guy talks about, you know, uh, with the system. Right. Fair, fair enough. But I don't think you've done enough research. I think it shows a bit of a smugness from your behalf that you're just kind of bunged in just to show that you're secular with your views on all religions. Um, well, I, I do believe there's, there's goodness in all religions and all ways of life. What, what, what your points you discuss about one love, consciousness, Carl Sagan stuff, that comes from the Vedic scriptures. It comes from you Hinduism, know. it comes from Buddhism, yeah. it comes from Christianity, exactly. Exactly. it comes from Muslim, the Islamic exactly. tradition in certain parts. That's yeah. why I discuss this. I'm yeah. not, I'm not, I, as I say in the film, all, it's a 
what is the failure of religion is the separatism. It's to think that one's better than the other. So what but, I do in this but, film, but, but, I go, it's not yeah. secular per se. Krishnamurti is not secular, he's not religious, yeah. he's a philosopher. Yeah. I feel in the first films, like I said, I have a Buddhist leader speaking yeah. at the very beginning. I'm actually very religious in a general sense to the extent that I know the things I don't know. I don't believe in a creator because there's no evidence for that. I use my mind and I relate to nature. True okay. religion is relation to nature. Okay. So I don't, I'm not trying to dismiss anything. What I'm trying to do is say that there's a lot of great things and there's a lot of very bad things. And the, m the main point yeah. is that it's divisionary. Well, as long as we have these established structures, fair enough, fair enough. It's, nothing's going to help. Division is created by political ideologies, not religions. There's well, a difference between political ideology if, and if religion. If you read, it depends how you choose to interpret the text. Yeah, okay, fair enough, but... Okay, fair enough. Thanks, mate. Right, you're right. First well, of all, it's not... It's the, it, I'm not having double standards. As I said repeatedly in the film. R money is faith. Hey, can we all wait our turn? That'd be great. Hey, let me say one more thing on this. The issue of faith in most traditional religions, this is what I relate to with myth in the first film. It's, a, it's these, these notions of faith. And what this means is that, and this is the same for money, is that people just accept what they've been told and they feel that they are against God if they choose to question it. And I think this is a very bad disposition. That's all. Well, I, some, some of them have certain things like that, but yes, you're right. No, I'm, I, religion is vast. I'm not, I go to the established religions, the ones that have the biggest clout, the biggest political control, the ones that have been around the longest, that have sh obviously proven that they are outdated. They have kernels of truth, but the practice is really pushed away from benefiting humanity. First of all, mate, right. first right. of all, I want to acknowledge him for putting this work out there because nobody else is doing this work. That is absolutely amazing. Very, very amazing. And the great thing is he's not saying it's perfect. He's saying it needs work, but it's the start of an idea and we need this change right now in this society. In this planet, we need this change. What, we do. We need this change, right? We need this change. One thing that this movie prescribes to, which will make a big difference, and I think it doesn't say it openly, is that this, all this new idea, this new world, is going to come from a deeper part of us than we're already seeing at the moment. And the deeper part of us is beyond the mind, beyond the ego. When people come from the core, where all the answers are, we don't need to have philosophies. We don't need to have religions. In the core, we are all connected. We all know exactly what to do, but it's because we're coming from the mind and the ego, which is in this domination control sort of light, where we're coming from the darkness to the light, we're now coming back into our light. And through this light, we will, this is, this is part of it. This is so part of it, mate. Sure. I really acknowledge you. This is amazing sure, to sure. see this. And I, Absolutely my, and amazing. I, well, thank you. And Okay. Um, and the word I use to define that, the word I use to define that is that eternal oneness, that this interconnectivity, this symbiotic relationship that exists on so many profound levels. And that's, that's the way I would describe it. Thank you. All right. I, I, I want to keep comments to a minimum, really, because we've got a lot of questions, I'm sure. So um, there's two here, and then I'm going to pass it back here afterwards. Hello. Uh, yeah, firstly, good video. Um, <clears throat> very powerful. Um, I just want to add Alex Jones as well. I know he slated you on the interview that he gave you. Um, I, you know, I don't 100% follow uh, either of you. Um, you know, you, uh, both views sure. are good. Um, but yeah, I did think he was a bit harsh. But anyway, right. um, basically, come to the practicality of your, uh, of, well, of Venus Project and of your, um, uh, your movie. Basically, the transition between getting to, obviously, you know, idolized perfection uh, and that transition obviously a lot of people that um, basically freeloaders of our life that run on society off, off you know living in council hats with lots of kids if they don't see it uh, and if they see obviously that you know we're taking down the leaders um, you know we're, we're basically uh, fucking the system so to speak then right. you know surely they're just going to see it as a free ride just to go and like run right and loot and that because they're not going to see the alignment they're not going to give a damn about what we think you know as soon as we're taking down the thing and actually showing that we're doing it they you know 
there's going to be you know a lot of trouble, and there's going to be a lot of trouble like the next sure. four years anyway, because you know there's a lot of stuff happening over the next oh, four sure. years. But like you know, I know you've got the Zeitgeist movement. Who do you like? Um, I mean, are you saying yourself that you want to be the person that, to take us into the light, to guide us through? Or, no, I want or who every- would you say, and how would you say the practicality of I want to that everyone- stage? I want everyone to be their own leader, to understand with a core, basically the Zeitgeist Movement is a grassroots concept that is attempting to create a core philosophical perspective, so to speak. People that understand these near empirical truths, simplistic truths, truths of the fact that we're all connected, the truths of the fact that if there's a homeless person on the street, I am not safe. I have to, my integrity is only as good as the relationship of how well I take care of my environment, my planet, and the people around me. So when people understand this, when you say, well, I live, you know, I have a lot of money, and I live, and I walk down the street, and they have, you know, excuse me, I have my job, and they think they have a good life, but they're always looking out over their shoulder because of crime, because of all the aberrant creations that happen because of this system. So I think that's just one point. I think there are many, many philosophical, so to speak, points that people will realize and understand, and they're so empirical once you realize the system. And, for example, like someone working as a teller in a grocery store, like, you know, horrible that is a waste of life for someone to stand there and and waste their time when it could be automated like that to think that they should sit there like people on a subway line and making food it's these are the human brain has so much potential humans are sucked the life is sucked out of them by the system because you have to have money for to, to survive and you have to have labor for money so this is an outdated notion at this point. You can't, they keep making new jobs because they don't know what else to do. So my point is that there's these underlying elements, there's many of them, that I will communicate as the site develops that I want everyone in all countries, borderless, religionless, to say, well, wait a minute, this makes sense because we are all susceptible to this same, same thing. And then realize the corruption that's happening. And as far as the establishment, as far as who moves in to do something, it's going to be a collective type of awareness. It's going to be, I can't tell you, because I, I don't know Cause, how exactly. Cause a lot of people are going to look to a leader, uh, and they're going to want someone to guide him. Well, there will be that tendency, but I think once the once it happens, this is why I want to have this dispersion of people in all the countries that are advocating the movement. March 15th will be Zeitgeist Day, and I'm going to have it worldwide. And I'm going to do my best to have it, you know, there'll be probably uh, like webcasts for it, but I want to make sure that there's independent action happening with this general philosophy. It can even be different ideas, because I want people to fucking think, because they're not thinking in this structure to the extent of what it really advocates true change. And one more thing to answer your element about thinking that the new system is going to be another, another you know, establishment. And that is a big fear. I, I get this a lot. They say, oh, will you, any new power structure is just going to be another power structure and it's just going to exploit. But I think this is something that, because of the monetary system, can be grown out of once the monetary system is removed. And people understand that the more they give, the more they get. The more I give to somebody, as opposed to taking, because that's all our system does, you just take, 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 so everyone else takes from everybody else. And you get this mentality where everyone's rewarded for being a selfish prick, and that's what the whole system is. And you've got rich people that think they're successful because they have a lot of money, when in fact, most of them, like Warren Buffett, one of the richest men alive, he has contributed nothing to society. He gambled his way into, into financial independence. And this is one of those things that would be looked upon as like, what the, what, why? What is this guy doing? This will be criminal, so to speak. You want criminal because there'll be no such thing, but it'll be like abhorrent, be like, what the hell? Why? So the more you give in this system, the more everyone else gives. The more you want to take and be selfish, the more everyone else is going to take from you. So if that is the train of shot, that consciousness shift, the, the awakening of consciousness, the revolution of consciousness that Krishna already talks about, that's, that's what I advocate. And I think that will have a great effect on this fear we have of trying to, you know, not allowing people to have any type of control. So I, I, I do. I, can, I, can I just suggest, um, I'm really interested in how you're going to promote the movement. Uh, it's clear that we need a creative um, uprising at a grassroots level to actually implement the change in consciousness. Right. And um, I'd also like to ask if you are planning to make another film. I'd also like to suggest that on the 15th of March, we, uh, we chalk the zeitgeistmovement.com all over the walls and pavements of our respected cities sure. just to raise awareness. Yes, that's, that's a very good idea. I've, I want people to call into radio stations, television stations. I want there to be, all, it's just a public awareness campaign, not for Zeitgeist but, or the Venus Project, but for this advocation of a different worldview towards humanity and each other. 
That's really what it is. It's not, I'm not trying to be a leader of anything. I don't want to be a leader of anything because I want to live. If I'm seen as a leader of something and things get big, I'm dead. And I personally don't want to die, even though I don't really care in a lot of ways. I'm, I'm going to be dead soon enough. So if I could take it out for a good cause, well, that's good for me, I suppose. But nevertheless, and I'm dead serious, though, because leaders are taken out and there's a psychological ramification when they are. So we need a leaderless type of thing. Everyone needs to become the leader, just as Krishnamurti said. You need to understand what the, what the angle is, believe it, and know what's true and what isn't, what you agree with, what you don't, and advocate this to everyone you know. And that's what's going to happen. It's not going to be leaders it's anymore. It's a network. Yes. So can I add, when you've got everyone as the leader, when we are at that stage, who do you then say that has control to say that, you know, we all live like this, we all... At a you know, certain point, how, at a how, certain... Because, I mean, yeah. I know what Alex Jones says uh, on, on your interview to him about, um, you know, how the elite, there still be elitists saying how others will have to live, you know, how will you say, how will you make that benchmark, because how there's, will you make that... There's an, this isn't subjective, this isn't subjective. The, the, the most difficult thing to realize about this project is that the first th you have to look at this entire system as its relationship to the planet. So the carrying capacity of the earth and all the attributes on it come into relevance. It almost becomes self-evident after a certain point. First thing I will say is that a lot of the shit that we have, the materialistic stuff, has been forced into our culture. I would say 90% of all the technology we have is junk. It's garbage. The, thing, the fact that we duplicate things like crazy, rather than making like one cell phone that lasts you know, 50 years, which we could do, because the market system refuses to do it because in order to keep market share, you have to make shit out of bad materials. So naturally, planned obsolescence comes into play. Plus, they want planned obsolescence, such as automobiles, because they make more and more money. So the fact is, is that there's a duplication, a replication of things. There's such a tremendous amount of waste in the system that when you step back and look at what's actually ne what's a necessity of life, and I don't mean just like having bread and water, not at all. I mean a highly abundant system with all, all sorts of elements. The planet leads with a highly system of, of all sorts of abundance. Then the attributes of how we get this on a tangible utility on a util I'll answer that question in a second. On a utility basis, people will be, have a different relationship to the things that they have and what they use. So at that point, at that stage of awareness where people don't think of things, they don't look at themselves as representations of what they own and what they, what they wear, and they look at themselves as far as what they think and what they do. This is a colossal change that will directly influence what is produced in our society tremendously and reduce a dramatic amount of shit that's produced in a dramatic amount of waste. 75% of all production on average is waste. Just blatant waste. And think about all the dumb shit that people own that you, you wonder why. You know what I mean? It, just, it goes on and on and on. So, back to your specific point. If you have a, a plot of land, say an acre of land, and you want to do something with it, build something or grow something on it, you will gauge what that has to offer. You'll look at the nutrients to see what the propensity of that land has, you know, for, so say, growing a certain crop, or you'll look at the structure of it to what you can build on it. As far as, so it, it starts at a cellular level. It, it, the question isn't how, who makes the decisions, it's how are the decisions arrived at. And that is a colossal shift in our way of thinking. So subjectivity become, opinions and subjectivity become backdoor to availability, technological understanding. To put it into a terminology, it's the scientific method applied to human society, where we think about things scientifically as far as what's there, what we can do, and how do we maximize it, and at what is that, what is, Profit is not, for example, the creator of things. They, they say profit creates incentive. It's necessity. And there's plenty of things we can think of that, that we can constantly produce things of immense value to us in a utility and even artistic sense. You know, there's so much stuff that we can do. But this system is parasitic and paralyzing. So, you know, to think that we can never have an abundance in this system, first of all, that we currently have. We can never have all the things. So we're so, it's so foreign to us that we have no idea how to even comprehend it. So back to your original point and back to what she said, how does, the planet, how does the planet dictate these things? Well, first of all, we figure out what's important. We figure out what's real. We figure out what we need. First of all, you have people starving in Africa who have ate, dying of HIV. They, they don't have anything. And we sit here and bitch about tiny little things that go on, you know, people that complain about these nuances of government. They have no idea. They have no global perspective. So first we have to take care of the fact that we're not safe as long as people are dying in Africa. We're not safe on multiple levels as far as people are sleeping in the streets. First, we take care of all the bare necessities. It's a step-by-step -step thing in that regard. And then as things become more fluid, 
Government is essentially would be a series of technological individuals that they don't make decisions, they regulate the empirical system based on this nervous system of technology that is inside of the planet to decide what we have at all times. We navigate everything and all I can say is this long, long winded description, but Jacques Fresco, if you read his one of his books, uh, The Best Money Can't Buy, he goes into this specifically. It's a totally different world view that is so foreign to most of us. So I hope that answers your question to a certain degree. Well, you'd use things like the internet. You could have people. Here's, here's one thing I want to say real fast. As far as property and this idea of intellectual property, this would be gone in the future. If you invent something, say you come up with an idea, you won't have an inclination to want to sell it. You'll want to improve society with it. So it becomes the public domain. Everything intellectual is in the public domain. All music is in the public domain. So think about how cataclysmic life would be if you invented something and you let, left, left without patenting it or concealing it, you went and you left let everyone it put their influence on it. All other technicians come forward. Do you realize how cataclysmic our development would be if you had the input from, from the world it's and, and their, whatever expertise you were going for on a specific product, it would be unbelievable. It would be a cataclysmic shift if everyone actually worked together as opposed to fight. Only the great majority of things that we have today, only 4% of our population create. Why? Because most of the population is completely dumbed down. And they have no, they have no knowledge of, no, no broad knowledge whatsoever. They don't have a technical understanding or a mathematical or scientific understanding. They don't know how to contribute to society. So we're, we're stuck with people like Einstein and Galileo and these guys that, by the way, had no profit motive from what they were doing at all. They did it because they wanted to, to contribute, contribute to society. Einstein, well, what happened as through education is that people would grow and everyone would start to contribute in a gr amazing way because there would be no reason to have a stupid society. The government wouldn't, wouldn't construct its educational system the way it is because all the government wants is to have somebody that's just smart enough to run the machines and do the paperwork and just dumb enough to not question anything that's going on around them. And that's the balance that they've been maintaining for a long time. So anyway. Microphone's not working. Hello. Oh, yeah. Hello, sorry. Okay, I've got a million and one questions I'd like to ask, but um, the one question I will ask is how can everyone here that believes that we can go forward and kind of start making a difference, how can we go about doing that from now? How can we kind of go out, start spreading the word, opening people's eyes that kind of feel very kind of like blinkered? You know, the What's the transition? Well, yeah, they're, they're, they're the people that we've got to kind of like explain to them, I, mean, I, I say explain because I mean, that's, that's what we have to do. We have to go out there and kind of start explaining to people what's been going on, but how can we start making a positive difference to the world? In, well, well it's, I think the first step is education because the, the, I sense a very conscious awareness in this room, but a great majority of people on this planet are not even remotely close. I mean, we have the greatest, the biggest religion right now is Islam, which is growing very quickly, and it, it, it's inherently restrictive to its own development and rejects, you know, it rejects cultivation from the external world to a certain extent. It rejects modern ideology. It rejects, you know, it, it bases itself on belief. And that's a that's a major barrier for ideologies. So what we have to do is keep functioning with the commonalities. So what I would advocate first is that basically. The goal is to ultimately declare all resources on the planet as common heritage to everyone. So what we do is we start with the bare necessities, energy, which is why I go into it in the film. There's no reason for anyone to ever have to pay for energy whatsoever. And then it moves into food production. There's no reason for anyone to ever have to pay for food. You could have what you would think of traditionally as socialist programs in our current system, but they're not really that way whatsoever. What it is, it's, it's using our ability for technological abundance and, and using that at the core of this bare necessities energy, food, housing, and then as people wake up to this and they realize what's possible, then it will slowly expand into a much greater technological construction. So I think those are the first steps. But the first step is education because most people just have no consciousness of any of this. Sorry. Right. Yeah, because I mean, that, that's, a lot, that's, that's a very valid point. A lot of people, we're going to get shouted down. Um, people won't listen. They won't, they won't want to listen because of what they hear, like from everyone else, and what they're told. Kind of like that's what is black and white. And how can we kind of? Um, I mean, the internet's the last tool that we've got, really. Though yes. for me, that, internet's extremely that, that important. That is the last tool we've got to use. Yes. And I mean, I, I, I think you mentioned networking. 
I mean, people need to start talking, and there's so many of us out there with the same ideas and the same ideology, and we need to start talking and get together, and kind of, like, everyone needs to start working together and kind of sidestepping around the governments because they're just a massive barrier, and everyone needs to understand that, and we, we, we are the people that need to start making a difference. Yes, I completely agree. Absolutely. Just... The Internet is extremely important because it's unified the world in an intellectual way. And this is radical. It's very radical that we have this ability now. We have to preserve that and make sure that they don't shut anything down as far as, you know, the, the restructuring of it. So we have to preserve that by all means. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure you can tell us about the new Internet 2. Oh, yeah, all, all that shit. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's... Um, but while we're here, while there's a lot of us here, um, even after, after we finish with this question and answer with, um, with Peter... We've got an open mic, so do stick around and we can discuss amongst ourselves what we want to do. Um, next. was Zeitgeist Addendum, directed, created, written by Peter Joseph, and we're very fortunate to have Peter at this event here tonight, all the way from New York. Please welcome into the stage Mr. Peter Joseph. Thank you all for coming to this and watching it again. Can you hear me okay? Okay. So, would you like to begin? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and go straight into questions. I think the movie is pretty...
Well, that was Zeitgeist Addendum, directed, created, written by Peter Joseph, and we're very fortunate to have Peter at this event here tonight, all the way from New York. Please welcome into the stage Mr. Peter Joseph. Thank you. Thank you all for coming to this and watching it again. Can you hear me okay? Okay. So, would you like to begin? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and go straight into questions. I think the movie is pretty self-explanatory. So, uh, anything you want to throw at me, I think we're going to go around with a microphone. Yeah, I've got a microphone here, so, I mean, who wants to be first? Who's got a question? Uh, all right, well, seeing as he's standing right next to me, this might be tough. Dan. Hello there, my man. Um, oh. Thank you very much for that. I've been watching it all week, actually. Oh. I'm looking forward to you being here. Um, the question I've got is that, as I understand it, at the moment, uh, as a population, we're using up about three times the amount of resources that the Earth can sustain. So uh, I think ecological debt day is somewhere in April, which means that after that, we're using up stuff which the Earth can't replace. So, all over the walls and pavements of our respected cities, sure. just to raise awareness. Yes, that's, that's a very good idea. I've, I want people to call into radio stations, television stations. I want there to be, all, it's just a public awareness campaign, not for Zeitgeist but, or the Venus Project, but for this advocation of a different worldview towards humanity and each other. That's really what it is. It's not, I'm not trying to be a leader of anything. I don't want to be a leader of anything because I want to live. If I'm seen as a leader of something and things get big, I'm dead. And I personally don't want to die, even though I don't really care in a lot of ways. I'm, I'm going to be dead soon enough. So if I could take it out for a good cause, well, that's good for me, I suppose. But nevertheless, I'm, I'm dead serious, though, because leaders are taken out and there's a psychological ramification when they are. So we need a leaderless type of thing. Everyone needs to become the leader, just as Krishnamurti said. You need to understand what the, what the angle is, believe it, and know what's true and what isn't, what you agree with, what you don't, and advocate this to everyone you know. And that's what's going to happen. It's not going to be leaders it's anymore. It's a network. Yes. So can I add, when you've got everyone as the leader, when we are at that stage, who do you then say has control to say that, you know, well, we all live like this, we all... At a you certain know, point, how, at a how, certain... Because, I mean, yeah. I know what Alex Jones says uh, on, on your interview to him about, um, you know, how the elite, there'll still be elitists saying how others will have to live, you know, how will you say, how will you make that benchmark, because how will you make that... Because there's, no, this isn't subjective, this isn't subjective. The, the, the most difficult thing to realize about this project is that the first, you have to look at this entire system as its relationship to the planet. So the carrying capacity of the Earth and all the attributes on it come into relevance. It almost becomes self-evident after a certain point. First thing I will say is that a lot of the shit that we have, the materialistic stuff, has been forced into our culture. I would say 90% of all the technology we have is junk. It's garbage. The, thing, the fact that we duplicate things like crazy, rather than making like one cell phone that lasts you know, 50 years, which we could do, because the market system refuses to do it because in order to keep market share, you have to make shit out of bad materials, so naturally planned obsolescence comes into play. Plus they want planned obsolescence, such in automobiles, because they make more and more money. So the fact is, is that there's a duplication, a replication of things. There's such a tremendous amount of waste in the system that when you step back and look at what's actually ne what's a necessity of life, and I don't mean just like having bread and water, not at all. I mean a highly abundant system with all, all sorts of elements. The planet leads with a highly system of, of all sorts of abundance, then the attributes of how we get this on a tangible utility, on a util I'll answer that question in a second, on a utility basis, people will be, have a different relationship to the things that they have and what they use. So at that point, at that stage of awareness where people don't think of things, they don't look at themselves as representations of what they own and what they, what they wear, and they look at themselves as far as what they think and what they do. 
This is a colossal change that will directly influence what is produced in our society through what they do and eliminating the root causes of that behavior. That's when things are going to really get, become a mess for the establishment and they'll be forced to step aside because people won't tolerate it anymore. So what are the odds of martial law in the states and some kind of uh, an equivalent? What are the odds of martial law in the states being declared? Very, very high because it's, if and all what it takes be the repercussions? Is, all it takes is one big fear-based fear bank run and all one major bank run on a major bank will trigger a mass bank run on all banks and that's what they're trying to psychologically stop and I know you've had a few bank runs here in London in the, in the UK and we have some small ones in the States but once they do that and the system fails and the unemployment skyrockets people get all their money out um, they're gonna have no other choice but to get the National Guard into the streets and impose martial law that won't, probably won't last very long because if the system continues, they're not going to have enough money to even pay their soldiers. I'm serious. This is how bad this can get. It's a, the, the system is a Ponzi scheme. It's a pyramid scheme. And there's, it's, it's been a 100 year, 100 year, 150 year cycle of this expansion. And eventually, it's going to have to tilt. And they have to have a massive shakeout. And that's what's happening now. And they're trying their best to make it as comfortable as possible to not get panicked because it's a psychological game. The moment the public finally feels that that inkling of real panic is what they fear. I mean, they want, they want the system to collapse because it makes more dominance for their financial structure, but they walk a fine line because once it really falls and the people say, fuck this, I'm running to my bank, I'm going to get my guns, and I'm going to sit in my house, you know, this is the type of stuff that's going to start happening, that's when they're going to lose total control and you're going to see police in the streets, by all means. Sorry. Oh. I think we have experienced it. I think we have. I think we've all experienced those feelings of, of open compassion for each other and understanding that ownership is actually bullshit. Understanding that, that property and materialism is not real. I think when we treat each other like family, which is what we really are, genealogically, literally, I mean, we go back far enough, we're all fucking related. I mean, I think it's very real. I think we do experience it. Well, yeah. I disagree. I disagree. Okay. Um, it's, it's indeed important to be well educated and, and this movie is educating people in a, in a way I believe is very good. But what I feel there is some, some things uh, I've learned in my life creations that happen because of this system. So I think it, that's just one point. I think there are many, many philosophical, so to speak, points that people will realize and understand. And they're, and they're so empirical once you realize the system. And for example, like someone working as a teller in a grocery store, like, you know, horrible that is a waste of life for someone to stand there and and waste their time when it could be automated like that to think that they should sit there like people on a subway line and making food it's these are the human brain has so much potential humans are sucked the life is sucked out of them by the system because you have to have money for to, to survive and you have to have labor for money so this is an outdated notion at this point. You can't, they keep making new jobs because they don't know what else to do. So my point is that there's these underlying elements, there's many of them, that I will communicate as the site develops that I want everyone in all countries, borderless, religionless, to say, well, wait a minute, this makes sense because we are all susceptible to this same, same thing. And then realize the corruption that's happening. And as far as the establishment, as far as who moves in to do something, it's going to be a collective type of awareness. It's going to be, I can't tell you, because I don't know how exactly. A lot of people are going to look to a leader uh, and they're going to want someone to guide him through. Well, there will be that tendency, but I think once, the, once it happens, this is why I want to have this dispersion of people in all the countries that are advocating the movement. March 15th will be Zeitgeist Day, and I'm going to have it worldwide. And I'm going to do my best to have it, you know, there'll be probably uh, like webcasts for it, but I want to make sure that there's independent action happening with this general philosophy. It can even be different ideas, because I want people to fucking think, because they're not thinking in this structure to the extent of what it really advocates true change. And but one more thing to, to answer your element about thinking that the new system is going to be another, another you know, establishment. And that is a big fear. I, I get this a lot. They say, oh, will you, 
any new power structure is just going to be another power structure and it's just going to exploit. But I think this is something that, because of the monetary system, can be grown out of once the monetary system is removed. And people understand that the more they give, the more they get. The more I give to somebody, as opposed to taking, because that's all our system does, you just take, 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 so everyone else takes from everybody else. And you get this mentality where everyone's rewarded for being a selfish prick. And that's what the whole system is. And you got rich people that think they're successful because they have a lot of money, when in fact, most of them, like Warren Buffett, one of the richest men alive, he has contributed nothing to society. He gambled his way into, into financial independence. And this is one of those things that would be looked upon as like, what the, what, why? What is this guy doing? This will be criminal, so to speak. It went criminal because there'll be no such thing, but it'll be like abhorrent, be like, what the hell? Why? So the more you give in this system, the more everyone else gives. The more you want to take and be selfish, the more everyone else is going to take from you. So if that is the train of shot, that consciousness shift, the, the awakening of consciousness, the revolution of consciousness that Krishna already talks about, that's, that's what I advocate. And I think that will have a great effect on this fear we have of trying to, you know, not allowing people to have any type of control. So I, this, you're going to have a few steps forward, many steps back, and eventually a big cataclysmic leap forward, or a massive ridiculous leap back. Because it's either we do something drastically, like have a global awakening to this type of concept as the system fails, as people are put out into the street, as people lose their jobs, they lose their homes. Coming from the United States, it's getting extremely ugly. You have people living in tents. Tent cities are emerging in the United States, which is unheard of for the United States, the wealthiest country in the world, theoretically. So these types of elements, these biosocial influences are what's going to make change. It's going to happen fairly dramatically. And on the con conversely, we're going to move into a third world war and completely destroy ourselves because that's the pattern that happens with these massive economic collapses. So my answer to your question is you have to start to ignore the system, ignore the power elite, and start working from a grassroots level and start to just move. And the other thing is why I advocate boycott in the military establishment is because if the, if the power elite didn't have the military and the police and the National Guard, they would have absolutely nothing because no one would be able to stop the awakening. So that's another aspect. They don't have anything but their, their military structures apart from, of course, they have their control and their mechanisms, but the mechanisms are only valid through enforcement. And if people actually wake up to the fractional reserve system, they wake up to the fact that the monetary system creates aberrant behavior, they wake up to the fact that, you know, we shouldn't be imprisoning people, we should be trying to figure out why they do what they do and eliminating the root causes of that behavior, that's when things are going to really get, become a mess for the establishment and they'll be forced to step aside because people won't tolerate it anymore. So what are the odds of martial law in the states and some kind of uh, an equivalent? What are the odds of martial law in the states being declared? Very, very high because it's, if and all what it could takes be the is, repercussions? All it takes is one big fear-based fear bank run and all one major bank run on a major bank will trigger a mass bank run on all banks and that's what they're trying to psychologically stop. And I know you've had a few bank runs here in London, in the, in the UK, and we have some small ones in the States, but once they do that and the system fails and the unemployment skyrockets, people get all their money out, um, they're going to have no other choice but to get the National Guard into the streets and impose martial law. That won't, probably won't last very long because if the system continues, they're not going to have enough money to even pay their soldiers. I'm serious. This is how bad this can get. It's a, the, the system is a Ponzi scheme. It's a pyramid scheme. And there's, it's, it's been a hundred year 100 year, 150 year cycle of this expansion and eventually it's going to have to tilt and they have to have a massive shakeout. And that's what's happening now and they're trying their best to make it as comfortable as possible to not get panic because it's a psychological game. The moment the public finally feels that, that inkling of real panic is what they fear. I mean, they want, they want the system to collapse because it makes more dominance for their financial structure, but they walk a fine line because once it really falls and the people say, fuck this, is that through technolo it's technological resource, first of all. It's not even the notions that you describe. It, the technological resource will have built into it the redundancy necessary to make what you say a non-issue. So I, I think that's all built into what his, his plan is. And ultimately, are we aiming to uh, create everything the Venus Project aspires to in order to sustain the current population or a projected future population of about 9 billion, I think we're looking at, or does it have some vision of how the population will become eventually self-regulating? I think that through time, through, say, the awakening of people in their religious beliefs, 
people will begin to understand, first of all, no one on this planet virtually has any idea, at least the social systems certainly don't, they don't relate to the environment or the earth on any level. We don't even know how to use the planet. So what's going to happen eventually is the awakening will occur where people will begin to realize their symbiotic connections to the nature and symbiotic connections to each other, and they'll begin to say to themselves, well, if I have a child, what, what is the ramifications of this? They will begin to understand their relationship just like they think of their financial budget if they have a child. And a consciousness will occur where people will not be regulated, no one will be forced, there won't be a one-child policy or anything like that. If this ever comes to fruition, I think people will naturally, as they become more accustomed and more aware, think more, less selfishly about having like 10 children because they'll realize the ramifications of that. Most do not. You have religion that tries to perpetuate this, you know, this constant you know, perpetuation of, uh, of humanity, they just perpetually have Catholicism, you know, they don't use protection, you know, they, they just, there's this pumping out of human beings, which is great in its abstraction, but it's not something that is oh, conscious to the state of the planet. So I believe all of those things will resolve themselves based on education, not on like a, not a construct of law at all, but people will begin to realize what their ramifications are. It was very funny, I was having a conversation with Jacques, and he was like, yes, I met someone who had 10 children. I asked her, why? I asked, what are they, what are they for? And it was one of these weird things that no one thinks about, like, what are your children for? Not that they're to be slaves, but it was like a conscious notion of, why do you have all these children? What's the satisfaction? What you tend to find is people that have children because it has a, they lack something. They either want tons of love or they want responsibility or they lack something personally where they feel the need to have all of this responsibility or it comes from a religious consciousness where they don't want to have abortions or use protection because their value systems are based on this, you know, this empirical notion that everything is just as it is and I have no control. So I think those things will work themselves out and it's been talked about in great detail by Jacques. So I think, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things I could say on that, but I think it will not be something that has to be regulated. People will grow in consciousness, and they'll begin to understand their relationship, and therefore their childbearing will come into fruition, just like how they treat their environment and how they get, engage in, in the environment in general. Yeah, I'm hoping it works out that way, too. I uh, do. Thank you very much, because that's uh, really helped me engage with you know, the project. Oh, thank you. Oh, I see a lot of hands up. Um, what they are doing, in effect, Completely. I can, I can relate and, to that. And uh, this lack of love is because we are all interweaving with each other. And if we start to open our hearts for all of us, also for those people who are in greed, but we choose what you tell, we choose what we want in our life by indeed uh, doing boycotts, not taking part in all these actions. Mm -hmm. But we open our hearts, we truly forgive all these people. Right. They cannot be in greed anymore. Greed yes. will just vanish. Right. Because if I love you, you cannot be greedy of me. You I don't agree. have to take anything from me anymore. Right. Which is the, the ultimate state of having a system where things are just available. Because if you have things available, I'm just going to jump to this very quickly because there's many different angles here. But if you have, so you can walk into a grocery store and get the food that you need and it, you don't have to pay anything for it. So what does that mean? It means that it, why would someone run in there and start stealing tomatoes? Because they would, they would have no reason for it. They couldn't sell it. They would have, they would, they would go bad eventually. You know, there's no reason, to, even if it was physical properties like, like televisions and things like that. Why would someone want to just take a bunch of televisions? They can't sell it. They can't, they have no reason to hoard it. And what that means is an openness of love for the community. It's a, it's an open trust. So the greed would vanish because greed is essentially a culturally produced element, just like bigotry. No one's born with greed. You're born with a general sense of wanting things and learning. But greed in a materialistic sense, as far as all this shit's concerned, that's conditioned upon us. You know, greed for my clothes, greed for everything that's fought for in a greed sense is conditioned. And we have to condition out of that. And that's why I advocate this social system, because it would actually eliminate that. Well, it's not my system. It's, I'm sorry, what did you say? I'll explain the question if you, to those who can't hear it. Okay. 
They're controlled and they're mechanisms, but the mechanisms are only valid through enforcement. And if people actually wake up to the fractional reserve system, they wake up to the fact that the monetary system creates aberrant behavior, they wake up to the fact that, you know, we shouldn't be imprisoning people, we should be trying to figure out why they do what they do and eliminating the root causes of that behavior, that's when things are going to really get, become a mess for the establishment and they'll be forced to step aside because people won't tolerate it anymore. So what are the odds of martial law in the states and some kind of uh, an equivalent? What are the odds of martial law in the states being declared? Very, very high because it's, if and all what it could takes be the is, repercussions. All it takes is one big fear fear based bank run, and all one major bank run on a major bank will trigger a mass bank run on all banks, and that's what they're trying to psychologically stop. And I know you've had a few bank runs here in London, in the, in the UK, and we have some small ones in the States. But once they do that and the system fails and the un unemployment skyrockets, people get all their money out, um, they're going to have no other choice but to get the National Guard into the streets and impose martial law. That won't, probably won't last very long because if the system continues, they're not going to have enough money to even pay their soldiers. I'm serious. This is how bad this can get. It's a, the, the system is a Ponzi scheme. It's a pyramid scheme. And there's, it's, it's been a hundred year... 100 year, 150 year cycle of this expansion, and eventually it's going to have to tilt, and they have to have a massive shakeout. And that's what's happening now, and they're trying their best to make it as comfortable as possible to not get panic, because it's a psychological game. The moment the public finally feels that, that inkling of real panic is what they fear. I mean, they want, they want the system to collapse because it makes more dominance for their financial structure, but they walk a fine line because once it really falls and the people say, fuck this, I'm running to my bank, I'm going to get my guns, and I'm going to sit in my house, you know, this is the type of stuff that's going to start happening, that's when they're going to lose total control and you're going to see police in the streets, by all means. Sorry. Oh. I think we have experienced it. I think we have. I think we've all experienced those feelings of, of open compassion for each other and understanding that ownership is actually bullshit. Understanding that, that property and materialism is not real. I think when we treat each other like family, which is what we really are, genealogically, literally, I mean, we go back far enough, we're all fucking related. I mean, I think it's very real. I think we do experience it. Well, yeah. I disagree. I disagree. Okay. Um. was Zeitgeist Addendum, directed, created, written by Peter Joseph, and we're very fortunate to have Peter at this event here tonight, all the way from New York. Please welcome into the stage Mr. Peter Joseph.
Thank you. Thank you all for coming to this and watching it again. Can you hear me okay? Okay. So, would you like to begin? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and go straight into questions. I think the movie is pretty self-explanatory. So, uh, anything you want to throw at me, I think we're going to go around with a microphone. Yeah, I've got a microphone here, so, I mean, who wants to be first? Who's got a question? Uh, all right, well, seeing as he's standing right next to me. This might be tough. Dan. Hello there, my man. Um, oh, thank you very much for that. I've been watching it all week, actually. Oh, I'm looking forward to you being here. Um, the question I've got is that, as I understand it, at the moment, uh, as a population... ...council hats with lots of kids, if they don't see it, uh, and if they see, obviously, that you know, we're taking down the leaders, um, you know, we're, we're basically uh, fucking the system, so to speak, then right. you know, surely they're just going to see it as a free ride just to go and like, run right and loot and that, because they're not going to see the enlightenment. They're not going to give a damn about what we think. You know, as soon as we're taking down the thing and actually showing that we're doing it, they, you know, there's going to be you know, a lot of trouble, and there's going to be a lot of trouble in like, the next sure. four years anyway, because you know, there's a lot of stuff happening over the next oh, four sure. years. But like, you know, I know you've got the Zeitgeist movement, who do you like? Um, I mean, are you saying yourself that you want to be the person that, to take us into the light, to guide us through? No, or I want or who every, would you say, and how would you say the practicality of getting I want to that everyone, stage? I want everyone to be their own leader, to understand with a core, basically the Zeitgeist movement is a grassroots concept that is attempting to create a core philosophical perspective, so to speak. People that understand these near empirical truths, simplistic truths, truths of the fact that we're all connected, the truths of the fact that if there is a homeless person on the street, I am not safe. I have to, my integrity is only as good as the relationship of how well I take care of my environment, my planet, and the people around me. So when people understand this, when you say, well, I live, you know, I have a lot of money and I live, and I walk down the street and they have, you know, excuse me, I have my job and they think they have a good life, but they're always looking out over their shoulder because of crime, because of all the aberrant creations that happen because of this system. So I think that's just one point. I think there are many, many philosophical, so to speak, points that people will realize and understand. And they're so empirical once you realize the system. And for example, like someone working as a teller in a grocery store, like, you know, horrible that is a waste of life for someone to stand there and and waste their time when it could be automated like that to think that they should sit there like people on a subway line and making food it's these are the human brain has so much potential humans are sucked the life is sucked out of them by the system because you have to have money for to, to survive and you have to have labor for money so this is an outdated notion at this point. You can't, they keep making new jobs because they don't know what else to do. So my point is that there's these underlying elements, there's many of them, that I will communicate as the site develops, that I want everyone in all countries, borderless, religionless, to say, well, wait a minute, this makes sense because we are all susceptible to this same, same thing. And then realize the corruption that's happening. And as far as the establishment, as far as who moves in to do something, it's going to be a collective type of awareness. It's going to be, I can't tell you, because I don't know how exactly. A lot of people are going to look to a leader, uh, and they're going to want someone to guide him. Well, through there will be that tendency, but I think once the once it happens, this is why I want to have this dispersion of people in all the countries that are advocating the movement. March 15th will be Zeitgeist Day, and I'm going to have it worldwide. And I'm going to do my best to have it, you know, there'll be probably uh, like webcasts for it, but I want to make sure that there's independent action happening with this general philosophy. It can even be different ideas, because I want people